What about that Vangelis music for uh, Chariots of Fire? Huh? Charge, but it's not going to charge in time. Just how come it needs to charge is bizarre because it was totally charged up earlier. Oh, good. Where were they? Of course they were. Ah. Okay. I see the problem. Um. I'm 
having a USB issue. I need a... Because mostly you just saved all of our lives. <laughs> That's the problem. Is this one? She probably is getting uh I guess that's it. Huh? Yeah. Are you in withdrawal? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Can't tell if the whole thing is there. I gotta tweet out this this YouTube thing. Live, it looks good. He was here for one night. Okay. Are you here now for the rest or just home? Yeah, I'm here for the rest of the week. So okay. my husband and I have a house on the island. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Out beyond the, 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 the trail here. Uh -huh. um, and 
So we go back and forth between here and Providence, Rhode Island, and uh, I think they're just rounding. Oh, oh, so, okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, Eastern. Uh-huh. Eastern. Yeah. 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 Y
for those of you who aren't in the middle class, you should know that these students have worked individually on these problems. That is, they've led the project, the design, the data collection, the analysis, the presentation, everything. But almost every project in here involves a lot of help from other members of the class. And so it, it's, it's really an exercise in getting a compact, dense data set gathered and analyzed in a short period of time. So without further ado, because we have a long day ahead of us, MC Rain is going to speak to us about tearing skin. Hi, welcome. Um, I'm MC. I normally do Shark Thing in Mary and Ashley Ross's lab, but today we're going to talk about skin. All right, so skin. You guys all know what it is. We all rely on it. It's really good at keeping our insides inside, which is crucial. Fish are also very familiar with the concept of skin. Um, they use it for a variety of different reasons to defend against predators. So the lionfish uses it to show off his coloration and it basically tells predators, I'm poisonous, don't eat me, it'll be bad for you, don't eat me. Um, sea dragons and a lot of other things will use it to camouflage. So this guy basically just looks like seaweed to avoid predation. Um, packfish do this really gross, cool thing where they just emit all this goo from their skin which means that when predators go to eat them, instead of getting hagfish, you actually just get a mouthful of goo, which I can imagine is not pleasant. Um, poachers, which is a classic Friday Harbor example, um, are armored to defend themselves against predators. And then flatfish have a bunch of different scale types that we think helps them in defense against predators somehow. So why have scales? Um, in a previous fish class project, Mike Nakazi uh, tried to look at puncture resistance of skin and essentially found that it's not good at resisting puncture, so that's not that helpful. Um, and especially, it was more a factor of how thick the scales were and the skin rather than a difference between the scale types. Other studies have looked at if the skin is helpful against sediment friction. So basically, flatfish bury themselves underneath whatever sediment is on the bottom and normally it's not going to be just this pleasant beachy sand. So it's full of like rocks and other particles that might scratch them on either the side that they bury them, so the blind side, or where they're putting the sediment on top of them, so the eye side. So I was thinking about if tearing was somehow going to affect the skin, and if the skin is more resistant to tearing from predation rather than this sort of punctured approach. So, as you can see in this video, Flatfish get eaten and attacked by a lot of things. So this is a bird that, don't know how it spotted it, birds are cool, um, just grabs it and you can only imagine how sharp those talons are and how if the flatfish can somehow resist that tearing of the claws, maybe it can get away. It's not successful here, but maybe. <laughs> um, and then if you can't see, this is a tiny flounder in this seal's mouth. Um, probably not having a great day. <laughs> and if it could somehow resist the tearing of those teeth, it could give it just enough time to get away. So maybe there's something in the fact that the skin resists tearing. So the two species that I worked with are Clopictes salatus, which is the starry flounder, and Isopseta isolepis, which is the butter sole. Uh, they have two different types of scales. So the Clopictes have these tuberculate scales, and they're really sparsely distributed. There's no pattern whatsoever on how the scales are amongst their skin. And they're these really kind of stiff, they stick up. I couldn't even break them off with a scalpel. They're very tough. Um, and a lot of people call this fish the grindstone because supposedly, unconfirmed in old days, they would use it as sandpaper. It does feel like it though. Um, and the isopseta have these tenoid scales which cover the entire body and fall off really easily. I mean, it's insane how you, even just touching them, scales everywhere. So there are two completely different types of scales. Um, and basically we caught just a ton of them trawling in Puget Sound. And then I said, what if I just tear the skin? <laughs> so like I've been saying, my main question is essentially, do the different scales have different tear resistance? Um, is it different between the species with the different scales? Is it different between the eyes and the blind side? Um, and is there any effect of the direction that I tear? 
So essentially, dorsal ventral or anterior posterior. So, let me get more. <coughs> so, I would take my fish and I would skin the portion outlined in orange. Um, it was actually pretty easy, shockingly, mm -hmm. because just tear the whole skin off. Um, so, I would get basically from cotton peduncle to pectoral fin. And then, once I had that, I would cut out two 30 by 30 millimeter squares with a 15 millimeter notch in the middle. So, and I would do that on both the eye and the blind side. And so, because flatfish are weird, and because this, I'm probably still gonna mess it up, I'm gonna walk you through what these notches mean. So, the dorsal ventral is, if the notch that I made, like 15 millimeter cut, is perpendicular to the lateral line, and anterior posterior is if that notch is parallel to the lateral line. So basically, anterior is comparing tail to eye. Okay. I'm going to show these constantly when I show them because it's so easy. Okay, so...
small isostata. So if we have larger ones, maybe they would be up here. So that's my sample. But there was a huge difference in the tear direction. So just like I had witnessed with the two pieces, when it was torn anterior posterior, they extended for a lot longer than when they were torn dorsal ventral. So that was super cool. So to sum up work, the amount of work it takes to tear a piece of skin seems to be heavily dependent on plastixes, or I mean species and then scale type. Um, Plastixes is more resistant. That's also confounded by the fact that size is significant. So maybe it's just the bigger you are, the harder it is to tear. But for extension, direction of tear seems to be really significant in how it affects it. So that's super cool. I ended up finding no difference between the eyes and the blind side, which I guess makes sense because if you're going to be attacked from either side, you need both sides prepared. So then with extension, I started thinking about if it were possibly due to the collagen fiber arrangement. So this is the plastixes under the microscope, and you can really clearly see in this box all of the fibers that are kind of just this way and this way. Um, and I measured against the lateral line, which is this. Um, and so the plastixes had a fiber angle of about 50 to 55 degrees. To the lateral line, and this is isosceta, and they have a fiber degree of about 40 to 45. So there is a difference between these two in their fiber arrangement. So I'm thinking that maybe if I had larger sizes, that that difference between the species would start to come out. Um, so basically, like I've been saying the whole time, I would love more sizes, so broader size range for both species, and then adding in the porosity specialist, which has the cycloid scale. So it kind of falls in between the tough, sparsely distributed scales of the platyxes and the really flimsy, covered all over the place isopseta. So it would be a nice comparison to have to see if it fell in the middle of all those. Um, and then, because we're biomechanists and we like to model things, it would be nice to be able to model the skin somehow and see if I could scale up the scales to see if that had any effect. So, thank you to Alice and Adam, also my TAs, Hannah for solving the R problems that I could not solve on my own, and then my emotional support group, the fish class, and my favorite fish, Harold. <laughs> <laughs>
4,000 slices for my individuals. And what I did is I segmented the jaws out from the body in slices, and then I looked at these various parameters. So the first parameter I looked at was second moment of area, which is the resistance to bending, and I looked at this in BoneJ, which is a plug-in in ImageJ. And I also looked at the jaw mineralization through looking at the pixels of the CT scan, as well as the jaw lever mechanics and the myology of the muscles. But for this talk, I'm going to be mainly focusing on the jaws and their stiffness and the mineralization. So what is second moment of area? So I mentioned that this is the resistance to bending. Um, it is um, designated by I. And so um, this is the equation. So it's calculated as um, the cross-sectional area, the sum of the cross-sectional area of a beam um, multiplied um, by the distance between that cross-section and the neutral axis. So how can we... Somewhere in the middle, and this this way we can compare if we 
unique shape of the jaw in certain slice, um, how much better that is at, bend, at resisting bending compared to if it was just a circle. So to orient you again, here's um, these data for the neonate. So we have that ratio on the y-axis and then the slices across the jaw. Um, so here's one of the reconstructions of the neonate jaw. Um, so this is for the lower jaw. And so we can see the similar pattern that we saw um, in our first graph, where the resistance to bending is highest at the top and the other two kind of break away. And now we can look at this through our study. So here's those same data we just looked at for our smallest ray. And then our next ray, we can see there, there's actually a decrease at the second moment at the um, jaws right near the joint and kind of a slight increase um, right near the teeth. And we can see that this pattern continues um, through their unpaution. So it's kind of, it's fairly similar. Um, these lines are kind of close to each other through their development, suggesting that um, this ratio of their shape to that of a circle um, is similar as they grow, although we can see these kind of differences kind of just decreasing um, at the jaw joints as they get larger and increasing near the teeth. So what do these data look like compared to some other dark vein strains? Well, if we look in this published literature, we can see, we can map the eagle ray on here. And the first thing we notice um, is that eagle ray has a much higher second moment of area, but we can also see that there's quite a different pattern in that distribution of resistance to bending through the jaw. So an eagle ray actually has the highest resistance to bending in the middle of its teeth, while the pull guy has it at the joint. And then for comparison, we also have a horn shark, another part of the last trick, that has kind of a similar pattern to the eagle ray. And there's also differences um, in the mineralization of these jaws, which isn't taken into effect here, that also influences the thickness. So I also looked at the jaw mineralization of the next one. So here, um, on the right-hand side, we have the smallest ray, and the medium-sized ray, and then the largest ray. So the general um, pattern I found was that as the ray gets larger, the mineralization increases underneath the teeth compared to underneath the jaw joint. And what we also saw um, was that in the adult ray, we actually saw the presence of terrestrial as well, which is the reinforcing, reinforcing strut um, that buttress the jaw and help provide more stability. So what were some of these differences that we saw in the neonate? So in the neonate, we saw they didn't have as stiff jaws as compared to the adult. The ratio of the shape at the jaw compared to the circle was higher on at the joint. The jaw joints were fairly well mineralized, but they were not very well mineralized at all at the teeth, and they did not have the presence of trabeculae, so these reinforcing struts. So I kind of question whether at this stage in their life they can actually eat hard prey. So the adult, conversely, has a lot stiffer jaws, uh, they had a lot stiffer jaws specifically underneath their teeth. Um, their teeth were also, the area of their jaws under their teeth was actually well mineralized and they had trabeculae. So, thinking about this in terms of what makes something duraphagus duraphagus, um, we can look at a variety of traits um, that are often characterized by different taxa that eat hard things. So we have some taxa on this side, um, different duraphagus Hard-lacking fishes, and then we have a variety of traits um, that will generally benefit them in eating hard prey. And what we what we can see when we look at this chart immediately is that there is a really wide distribution of what um, species have what traits. So there's not a simple kind of um, cookbook for um, making a ray that can eat hard things. Um, for example, if we look at my little batters, we can see that it doesn't really have these large jaw muscles, but it has very high mechanical advantage or force dispersion of jaws. But if we look at Rhinoptera, they actually do have large jaw muscles, but they don't actually have um, high mechanical advantage. And we can compare that to the Apulidae. It doesn't seem to have very high second moment compared to some of these other taxa, but it has large muscles, trabeculae, and high mechanical Advantage. So um, it seems like there are many solutions um, for going about eating hard prey.
spring um, with the golf skeleton. Um, so thank you to everyone. Um, it's been Matt has been a great mentor and Cassandra for helping me with my cipher. And Adam and Alex and Sarah and Diego. And then um, our fifth class. So thank you guys. <laughs>
fines have been reduced. Uh, we still have five SIM rates, but there's no segmentation at the end of them. Uh, this is a CT scan, it's kind of hard to see, of the basal expansion of the pelvic girdle in the snailfish. And just to orient you, this is the SIM rate coming off. All right. Here's an SEM scan of one of the fin rays of the snailfish. Um, and as you can see, there's the unsegmented lepidic trachea end. And I'm just gonna say that this is going to be a basal expansion of the base of the fin ray, forming a chevron-shaped unit. Here's a CT scan of his new <laughs> my peristenii. <laughs> this was my model that I reconstructed. And just to orient you, here's the adhesion disc inside of the ventral side of the disc. All right, so here's my 3D reconstruction of the lateral view of the medial um, musculature of the snailfish. In green, oops, in green, we have muscles that are originating at the base of the pelvic girdle and inserting into each one of the basal ends of the fin ray. Um, and for my talk, I'm mostly concerned right now with the intrinsic musculature, but I have added in here some muscles that are extrinsic, extrinsic and they're going outside of the pelvic girdle, and presumably into the pectoral girdle. All right, here's a lateral view of the deep distal musculature, and we have a muscle here that's originating at the base of the pelvic girdle and inserting into each one of the fin rays, starting with the first. Um, there's also a separate muscle here that's originating again at the more anterior end of the pelvic girdle and inserting in the first fin ray spine, or fin spine. And there's actually an also a muscle here that's um, attaching to the first spine and not originating on the base of the pelvic girdle. Here's a clearer picture of that muscle attached to the first spine. All right, so we have a muscle that's superficial to this group of internal or deeper musculature. And this muscle is quite interesting. Um, it extends out all the way down and goes on to the first ray and actually also appears to attach to the spine. And what's really interesting about this muscle is that it actually originates uh, on the medial side of the pelvic girdle. Um, and here, this is the extent of that. All right, so to make some homologies, uh, we have here the musculature of the lump sucker. Um, and then this yellow muscle right here is the, that's often called the adductor superficialis. And I'm hypothesizing that this may be the muscle that we see here, beginning on the, dis, the medial side and attaching um, on the external side to the spine and the first thing ring. And here the author has called this group of um, segment, this segmented muscle, the adductor profundus. And I would like to hypothesize that this is the same muscle group right here in the snailfish. Eventually, the author did not get a picture uh, taking off all these rays and getting a better uh, look at this. But oops, okay, we have um, this muscle here, the erector set. And in my image, I only have the one pink muscle that was coming in coming onto the spine, um, but I would like to hypothesize that that is an erector. And uh, here we have the uh, abductor superficialis, and I would like to hypothesize that these green muscles in here are homologous to those in the lump sucker. Um, and I should mention also that all I mentioned that this is abducting and abduction in the snailfish, as I will pass around in my model right here, um, they now go to the lateral uh, movement. Um, and future future research has to continue to develop these homologies. Um, I need to do more work figuring out the extrinsic mus musculature and making further homologies with the intrinsic musculature. And I'll do this by doing more reconstructions of my CT scans, uh, more dissections, 
and some clearing and cleaning work. Also, for future directions, I came across the work of Buzz et al., who has these embryonic stage snailfish. And what's really interesting is that the adhesion disc is actually fully formed for the most part in the embryonic stage. Um, and it's actually formed before the coral girdle forms or the caudal fin. Um, and I'm hypothesizing that this might be a form of heterochrony, where because nothing else was around this structure, it was able to expand out in the directions that it had. Um, and also this kind of just highlights how important this structure is for this fish, perhaps as a form of anti-predation, um, as the lung sucker has a lot of protection having armor on its skin, the snailfish actually doesn't even have scales, so And another area of future research is to look into the reduction and eventual loss of the adhesion disc altogether. So as I mentioned, not all snailfish live in the same place, and some are actually collegiate. Um, and uh, this is a term called as you can see here. There's a serious reduction of the pelvic girdle, and we're wondering at what point is the adhesion disc no longer functional as they um, reduce this in size. And there's actually, uh, from a quick look at the CT scan here, I was looking at Nexolite Paris, and they appear to not have any pelvic girdle at all. Hmm. Um, so future work needs to confirm or deny this. So um, pretty interesting. <laughs> um, and I would like to thank Diego for helping me with all my CT scans and just generally being there all the time. Mackenzie <laughs> and Sarah and Cassandra for all of their help. Alice and Adam and the fish class. Thank you. You had four of those muscles, the green guys, running laterally, and then one just swoops down ventrally yes. uh, to towards the posterior of the fish. What's going on there? Um, so I'm still kind of working on the muscles that um, are extrinsic in the fish, or in the structure here. So this one you're talking about yeah. here. Um, so when I did my reconstruction, I actually got a little bit of the other side of the disc, and so this muscle could actually be attaching to the beginning of the other side. Um, and I need to uh, clean this up a bit more and do some more reconstruction to understand fully where it's inserting and where it's originating from. But if you look, if you look at this one, there's actually this blue muscle right here that's kind of going out in the same direction. Um, and we're kind of wondering if this is um, the infracranialis muscle um, or uh, another muscle that might be, well, in this case, because it's exterior, it could be part of the trunk musculature, but I don't really think so. Um, I have to continue looking at what's going on there. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Once something goes 
out of the mouth, we have no idea what happens with it, right? I mean, you know because it's in your mouth and you can feel the things inside of your own mouth, but when you watch, okay, we checked this earlier in the paper. Um, when you watch it,
and also has overhear things that Carl Bean did. <laughs> We're not always clever. It doesn't always go that well. So what we're still missing is everything else. <laughs> All of the other fish, you know, diversity and what are they doing with their job. So today I'm going to be doing a oh, can see the time doesn't last here, but that's me. <laughs> trying to take one species and maybe expand the universe of what we can do here. <laughs> because we still have this problem, right? This is, oh, here we go. Okay. We still have this problem of this guy's not, you know, in that narrow circle of things that we can study with x-rays right now at least because he's too small. But he's doing something cool and we want to see what's going on. So what's, what was my solution? What I did, really high tech stuff, you take a piece of shrimp, you tie a string to it, great, you put markings on the string with a sharpie of different colors, five millimeters apart, <laughs> and then you feed that piece of food to a fish and watch the string disappear and then measure how much string disappears at different times happy. and how the fish is moving when that string disappears. So here's what it looks like in real life. I started referring to these as shrimp lollipops because at the end of there, that's a piece of shrimp. Actually, it's a prawn. So maybe um, and then these are the little markings of green, black, blue, black, red, black, and so on, so we can tell where we were in the string. And uh, here's what that looks like. So um, the species that I chose to study was Isoptera exolepis, the, the one of the species that Elsie just talked to you about. Um, they are a great animal for this because they are always hungry and they will always feed within seconds of food being put in front of them, which makes it great if you have three weeks to collect data. Um, they live right around here, so we went out trawling and caught them in Puget Sound. We also caught the prawns that I used for food in Puget Sound, so that was a nice one-to-one. -one. Um, and so if you look out here, this is, these are just their parenchyal jaws that are segmented out in a, in a CT scan to scan all fishes. In blue are the jaws themselves, so you can see these little toothy elements here, and that's about how big they would be and where they would be in the fish's head. So here's what it looks like. String disappears. <laughs> the weird thing is that if the this string is moving, nothing on the head is moving. This string is disappearing. So you would have no idea that this was happening with the string, right? You would think that the fish had been long done with feeding by this point. But it just keeps going on in. So then eventually, you know, there are a couple of these kind of skull-room things. This, I think, is the fish being bothered by the string, honestly, because when you don't have a string on the end, they don't do that. So what does this look like when we, when we actually track it out and ask what the fish is doing when the food is moving? So just to orient you, um, on the y-axis is head length, so everything was normalized to the head size of that particular fish. Um, and then the x-axis is just time in seconds, because it was a pretty long event. And this is sort of what the prey is doing. So you can see it shoots up really, really fast to about 40% of the head length, and then does this kind of slow, steady motion with a little bit of hiccuping towards the back of the throat, and then it hits about where the esophagus starts and it stays there, right? <coughs> so then if we look at what the fish is actually doing at this time, so this is oral gape. What we see is this like <coughs> big, big, big change in the oral gape right at first. That's sort of the continuation of the suction event, right? So it's sucking water into your mouth. The prey keeps moving really fast even if there's no suction in the mouth. And then the mouth stops moving. This is what you just saw in the video. It stays completely shut more or less the entire time except for at the end where, you know, it's probably trying to get the string back out of it. Oh, I should have mentioned, these dotted lines represent the start and the end, approximately, of the actual food transport event. Um, and then finally, we look at the breaking obstacle rate. So these are like, this is like that membrane that you see coming out of the operculum when the fish is breathing really hard. Um, and it's sort of a proxy for water exiting the head through the gills. And once again, we see there's this big change in it, right? Start of suction, and then nothing. It stays totally clenched shut. Water's not really moving through the head at this time. Something else has to be moving the food. So the other question that you have to ask about this is oh trace right balance, damage. right? Because fish are not, or at least the, the flatfish are not really eating very, very small food items. If you're a predator, your goal is to eat the biggest thing that you can successfully swallow without choking to death. And so, you know, these guys are hanging around, they eat a lot of like benthic macrofauna, so other fishes, they'll eat crustaceans, bivalves, you know, obviously prawns, usually not with the skin off. Mm -hmm. um, and so the question is, is this the same, is it the same transport behavior if you're trying to transport the biggest thing you can possibly swallow? So I also fed them really big pieces of shrimp. <laughs> I went with shrimp every single time because you can just cut it to an exact size, so I could keep the food at the exact same size every single time. And what you see is that this guy, so it's a kind of a similar thing, right? The shrimp, the string is disappearing into the mouth. But what you see is that you kind of have to work hard 
harder to get this food in there and you see this like big sort of this pumping action at the back of the gills and a lot of weird stuff going on with the operculum series a lot of wisdom going on there that i haven't been able to successfully quantify yet and interestingly you see a lot of wiggling going on at the euro file which i'm going to get to not in this project but eventually um but if you break it down the same way you see a very similar thing of this food shooting up to about halfway through the head and then doing this slow crawl and a couple of weird kind of jumpy motions where it goes backwards a little bit and then forwards and backwards a little bit and then forwards um, right towards the end there and then it reaches the end of the fish and stays there. And same thing with the oral gate, there's this big extension of the oral gate and then it stays relatively small for the rest of the feeding event. The brachiosum is great, you saw this in the video, there's a lot more pumping going on. And I'm still not really sure what that's about. You know, it could be that they're compressing the head, leaning hard to try and shove a really big piece of food into a very narrow space. It could be, you know, trying to flush water through the mouth to help move the food. Not totally sure yet. I'm going to have to track more videos. But if you look at the differences between large and small foods, so red is the small foods, blue is the large foods, um, and three different trials of each. In general, it takes way less time to process small foods than large foods. This itself is probably not a very interesting observation to you because you could have told me that fish take a lot longer to swallow bigger things because they're bigger. Um, exactly why is something that I'm still thinking about. Um, but if you modelize it so that each length, um, each each trial takes the exact same amount of time, so you're just normalizing it to the length of time it takes to swallow the food, you get almost shockingly identical trajectories between the small and the large foods. So this is not a different behavior. This is the same behavior stretched out longer over time. So it's actually, at least from the six trials we've had so far, extremely stereotyped. Um, so that's all great. But I still haven't actually told you anything about what, if anything, the Corinthian shells are doing in the head, right? All I told you is that it's probably not water, it's probably something else, and the only something else it could reasonably be is the Corinthian shell. So to me, this is the most compelling evidence that I have so far that it's the Corinthian shell, which is so on the x-axis you have head length, so here zero is the start of head, that's the mouth, and then one would be the approximate start of the esophagus slash the end of the gill um, and then on the y-axis, this is the amount of time that the food spent in each part of the head. And again, we have blue is the large food, red is the small food, no real difference there. And what we can do is ask, okay, where in the head did the peripheral jaws hit? Right? Because you can see the food is not spending an equal amount of time everywhere. It's spending the vast majority of its time in the last, the posterior half of the head, more than 90% of the time. Um, and the biggest chunk of its time is right here. And the peripheral jaws are exactly there. They're between about 60 and 85 percent of the head length, and that's where the food is spending between 50 and 60 percent of the time in every single trial they track. So that to me is pretty compelling evidence. Um, there's a few other things that I'm going to have to track, and of course the rest of the videos that I'm going to have to track in order to really show that because it is an indirect way of measuring this very sort of obscure, sort of hidden behavior. Um, but to me, it's kind of surprisingly clear evidence from a pretty low-tech assay. And then just to finish off, I'm going to show you one really fun video that um, just visualize flow in the head. I soak a piece of food in blue food dye, like commercial blue food dye, and you can see it coming out of the gills. Not necessarily relevant to what I talked about today, but it's too fun not to show you. Oh, sorry, yeah, I should also mention. So this is, this is what I've done here, this project. We're still left with everything else, but now at least it seems like we have a very low-tech, very cheap way of indirectly measuring most of everything else, mm -hmm. at least that eats solid food. So, here's the blue food dye. See that? <laughs> I love this so much. <laughs> I just see that if you feed them blue food dye on small food, you don't see anything coming out of the gills. entire teaching staff of the fish class, um, especially Sarah or Sophie, to figure out how to film animals in sort of a low-tech setup. Um, Beth, Alice, and Adam all for giving me really great advice and insight into, you know, all of these studies, and especially Beth for giving me the paper of the Carl Lee study where it gives the catfish. Um,
um, Elka, my lab mate, for sort of working out these ideas with me, and Charlie for helping me um, figure out some of the anatomy. Stacy Farina for explaining to me the, the class of Euro Lab. Jeff Jensen for talking about food transport in general to me. And Devin Lentil for providing some of the questions for me to come to. And of course, the entire fish class for being my, my emotional support. <laughs>
So the maximum stress that is uh, acting on this uh, intermuscular and abdominal muscles were uh, much higher when compared to the other type of things uh, like dorsal, pelvic, and pectoral, which have a larger surface area and uh, distribute very less force. So the bone mineral density of the bones gives a rough, rough indication of how much or how much of calcium and how is the uh, how is the ossification pattern uh, throughout the bones. So we used Tishan uh, for studying the bone mineral density and found that uh, the bone mineral density varied uh, throughout the bones and the uh, intramuscular bones which have a superior uh, mechanical property uh, was found to have a very less uh, um, bone mineral density when compared to the other type of uh, bones. It, uh, it, does, it didn't give them any clear indication of, uh, of how it relates to the strength of the bones. And uh, so the, in the second species which we observed, also we found that the intermuscular bones uh, withstood high, high feet load and uh, uh, similar the abdominal discs, the abdominal discs uh, which have a protective function uh, which is the maximum force and other types of uh, bones in the fish had a significant uh, high uh, force withstanding capability. And also when we analyze the feet stress uh, characteristics of all these bones, the, still once again the intermuscular bones uh, withstood a uh, high, higher amount of stress when compared to uh, all other uh, bones in the fishes. And uh, the BMD, uh, <coughs> in analyzing the BMD, uh, give a very varied uh, characteristics uh, and uh, uh, that every, uh, there was a huge variation in the bone mineral density when compared uh, to the previous species which we analyzed. And uh, also I studied the microstructure of the intermuscular bones uh, through the scanning electron microscope and <coughs> found uh, varied uh, tiny fibers running throughout the uh, structure uh, in a ra random fashion and uh, also studying the abdominal disc uh, microstructure it has a very highly dense packed uh, and well organized structure when compared to the intramuscular disc. So I, I, could, I would conclude that uh, the intermuscular bones have a uh, well advanced and an excellent uh, mechanical properties um, which uh, contributes to uh, providing increased, uh, which have a, which increases the stiffness of the overall fish. Also, uh, it reduces the deformation of the fish uh, during swimming and uh, helps in transferring forces uh, from the intramuscular bones to the muscles of the fish during any kinds of locomotion. And uh, but the mineral density values uh, which we analyzed uh, didn't give any clear indication of uh, how the mineral density relates to the overall strength of the bones which we analyzed. So a further study is uh, needed in this regard. So for the future work, I would like to study the histology and uh, also do processes. And I also thank uh, all the professors, uh, Alan Thomas, Alvis, and Bert, and also my advisors, Vikinti, uh, Bishan, and Kassandra. And also I thank uh, my professor, at uh, Hebrew University in Israel and uh, Sayan Harbour Lab for the funding for attending the course. Thank you. How do you explain the performance of intermuscular bones relative to ribs when they seem to be much less well mineralized and yet they're very strong? Do you have an explanation for the performance of the bones? No, I, uh, I, it is a surprise for me that how the intermuscular bones have such a good property and uh, I need to study further uh, to analyze how it's uh, having such a property. It might be the microstructure uh, and the arrangement of uh, collagen fibers should have, uh, should have made to have such an excellent property. I need to study this.
with my supplies, with my outfit, with my outfit. Sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> foundational um, studies that have been done over the past couple of decades, or a few decades really, and they've kind of grouped into these big um, areas of studying of uh, fish locomotion. So first we have suction feeding. Um, so here you can see the rapid acceleration to bring in prey into the mouth from the rapid um, increase in the buccal cavity. And then you have steady swimming right here where it's a constant velocity um, to maintain the, the area in the water column. And then you have these escape responses, which are personally most of my favorite. So you see these quick C starts um, and even F starts in some species. So these are all really fascinating and they've kind of laid the groundwork. Um, but what I was, was interested in is kind of the other spectrum of this. So rather than extreme acceleration or constant velocity, I wanted to look at um, how an animal begins and then slows down to a stop. So kind of a deacceleration and how they're able to maneuver around um, and do this behavior. So why is this important? Um, stopping ability is kind of has to do with maneuverability. So um, how mo the more efficient you are at maneuvering around your environment and being able to either um, capture prey or evade predators allows you to be more successful and to radiate. And it's also kind of a pervasive um, behavior among all fish in the world. Uh, so all fish move they must have been prey. And to measure that, I'm kind of relatively unstudied. So to digitize, I used XMA Lab, and um, I looked at different uh, 
point along the pectoral fin, as you can see here in my three different species. And to kind of visualize this, here is my illustrative golf man generic golf <laughs> And so to first look at the percent of fin area. So I analyzed from the dorsal view. So I looked, took five points along the pectoral fin and calculated the percent of area. So the more area I see from the dorsal view, the less is in the um, direction of flow. So there's less drag, essentially. Let's get into that later. And then fin angle, I took the, these three points and measured this angle right here and how it changed throughout the whole entire event. And then for braking performance, I took a point on the nose or the eye, which is one of the easier for my videos, and got, a, and got a velocity and also a deacceleration across the event as well. And this is just an example of pectoral fin motion, just to kind of orient yourself to the graph. So here we have area and here we have angle. And this is all kind of normalized, so time is not a factor here. And I did a smoothing throughout the whole entire event. And you can see the area of the um, fin visible in the dorsal view increases and then drastically de decreases, meaning that they're beginning to break and you push their fins closer or in direction to the water flow. And then for the angle, you see um, this kind of fluttering motion in the beginning and then a quick um, rapid increase in angle as they break into the water flow to um, increase drag. So here is the different species. So here you have purple, you have your um, exploratory species, yellow is going to be your less status armatus, that subintertidal, and then you have your high intertidal species here. And what's pretty interesting is that these two species um, are pretty similar with their percent area visible, um, but our maculosis, or our high inner tidal, is essentially putting all of their fin against the water flow for a quick break um, into the, uh, during, throughout the event. And to kind of visualize this better, here is then kind of shaded out. So here we have half of the fin that's going to be included into the breaking behavior, similar with our um, high, our low demand species, but then our high demand species that's high in their intertidal with various different flow regimes. We have minimal amount of um, fin that's not being included in the drag. And then when we look at fin angle, you see um, kind of a similar event where our two um, purple and yellow species, for um, simplicity, uh, they're pretty similar where they have um, a little bit lower of a angle in our low intertidal, but our maculosis, or our high intertidal, drastically increases. So they're very efficient with their breaks. They go full fin and, and rapid angle to quickly do a quick stop. And then, so looking at actual performance. Um, so looking at velocity, uh, and since due to time and the three weeks, I decided to look at both <laughs> maculosis and let's pass our mice, since those are our two known species from the previous paper. And when we look at these guys, the velocity over the whole entire event, so this is including time and the frame, frame rate and everything, you see it's similar. So there's no um, kind of derivation between the two different velocities. But when we look at uh, deceleration, you can see our mean maculosis is much more efficient at breaking and deaccelerating over the event compared to our less class harmonics. And I think um, this is only two individuals of three trials per individual, so I think if I increase my um, end number, this is gonna drastically change as well. Um, so, like I said, scalp, uh, scalp and pectoral fins across ecology, that one paper looked at the morphology and saw these distinct differences, and then my preliminary kinematic analysis has shown that these three species do have behavioral and performance differences, but then I was interested in kind of taking it down a level. So how do the mechanical properties of the pectoral fins change across morphology and behavioral. So now we're going to look at the mechanical level. Um, and measuring fin mechanics previously, is, as we saw today, second mode of area is similar, is a common way to look at um, resistance to bending, as well as here you see um, a, done by the water lab, where they get a single ray and they do a um, undulatory motion to measure the curvature. But I wanted to go a little bit more broad in my analysis and look at the full fin and how all the rays are, all the rays are acting as within in situ of the um, fin. So rather than looking at a single ray and saying this is how it performs, we look at all the rays in the fin and see how it performs under flow. So I did this um, in the flume and I put them on little um, clamps and there's a little fin right there from the dorsal view. And all of my videos were from um, the dorsal, or the ventral view, excuse me, and I was able to measure the displacement, or I will be measuring the displacement. And here is kind of in view of what happened here. So here we have our low um, demand sub-intertidal left tidal armatus. And here you can see the, um, this is frame one to all the way to frame six. And this is from two um, inches per second to 10 inches per second. I think they have some break yet, so I'll say. Mm -hmm. um, but you can see that there's clear bending. Um, this is gonna be your 
trailing edge, and here you can see the trailing edge beginning to um, bend with the water flow. And then when we look at our high intertidal species, this is going to be your trailing edge now on the left side. Um, and you can see it's also bending, but here you can see a lot more clear um, regionalization of the spectral extent. Um, and I will, kind of my future direction is to go in and actually quantify this and do comparisons and hopefully as well do my exploratory species in this as well and see how that, that thin morphology relates to um, full bend passive thin veins. Um, and just to, to kind of blow up that last picture, you can clearly see. And what was interesting is that it looks like the full fin of the leptized armonis is actually um, more resistance to bending in the full fin compared to our um, high intertidal species, even though this guy is more um, kind of exposed to high extreme velocities and more of a variation of flow regime. So in conclusion, um, the, the kinematic analysis does suggest that breaking behavior and performance is altered across species and it's related to their morphology and ecology. And the full passive bending visualizes the local and the regional differences along the fin rather than just looking at single ray. Um, and future analyses would be including the myastocephalus into my um, full fin as well as my um, secondary analyses and continuing the study forward. But with that, I'd like to thank both our instructors, Alice and Adam, um, our amazing TAs, Sarah and Cassandra, as well as Beth for doing the um, XMA lab workshop. That was really fascinating and I just love working with it, as well as Hannah. She was um, my go-to in all my analyses. <laughs> um, and also Sarah as well for handling all my stressful questions at random times. <laughs> and also thanks to the fish class, and don't forget to use the boat. <laughs>
13 people watching it.
of the mountain lion into bags and then we'll put it back in the box for you. Fabulous. And then I'm hoping maybe Wait, that's I'm kind of kind of the Thank you. 
Do we start up again?
had told me about her advice to you last night on the way home. That's why I had to do intermediate so they kind of I think they're occupying the same behavioral niche it's just a 
sampling bias as to this is one that's a little more significant here and this is more significant here. So the way that I've broken this down to is does it do a partial burial, which is defined as just getting the base of the head underneath this structure. 50% burial is is it getting 50% of its body meeting the center of mass underneath this structure, and 100% getting everything completely to the tip of the tail underneath this structure. And you can see that too when you bring up the complete burial. So the last thing that's really interesting is does it reemerge? So if it goes underneath that structure, is it interested in coming back out from underneath of it, or does it stay put? So with Zyphister, we can see it almost always contacts the rock. When it does, it almost always goes as a complete burial, and it rarely ever removes itself from that rock. So it gets under there and it stays put. It doesn't come out. Aphrodictes is really interesting too. So they don't seek out the rock, but when they contact it, they almost always go to full burial, but they always come back out from underneath the rock. They continue this exploratory stage where they don't stay put and don't stay underneath that rock any longer. Lumpiness is obviously the worst at it. They never completed 50% or partial burial. Um, this is probably just a biomechanical restrict. They're not built to do this. So if you were to put it underneath that structure without its uh, permission, without its will, like putting the rock on top of it, we're not sure what it would do to be able to reemerge or if it would be able to even function in that environment, but it's not able to move around properly. The uh, Anaplarchus species are probably almost exactly the same. We probably, if we test these statistically and really go through the math on this, they probably are not going to parse out. So we can get some conclusions from this. So Zyphoster is frequently going to seek shelter. It's typically going to just bury it to completion. It's not going to remove itself. It's going to stay underneath this rock. Both of the Anaplarchus species are often going to kind of stay put, but sometimes they're going to seek the shelter. They will often partially bury or sometimes full bury, but they often remove themselves from that rock again. They come back out into the open. Uh, Lumpiness is not good at anything. It just kind of sits there and is not able to function in a terrestrial environment whatsoever. And our Anaplarchus, I think, or I'm sorry, our Apodictes, I think, is really interesting because it really does not seem to seek those out, but when it does, it does bury completely. So it's physically able to do it, it just doesn't typically seek it out in natural environments. So our next section is do different species display different mechanisms? So for this, we pulled out the three that showed full burial most often um, to be able to test these. So that ended up being our, sorry about that, our, our Zyphoster. Um, we chose our Anaplarchus insignis and then our Apodictes again. So this is almost the exact same setup, except we took away that black piece of plexiglass that looks like a structure to them so that we could see underneath it much more clearly and do a midline analysis, really see what's going on so it's not blocking the nose. Um, but to do this, sometimes they didn't really want to go over here because it's just as bright, it doesn't look like a rock to them, so we had to use some tactile stimulation, which included poking, to get them to encourage them underneath the, uh, the structure there. So this is our Zyphoster doing the burying behavior. So essentially what you're seeing is this section over here is complete burial. This is in contact with the rock, but not complete burial. He's getting some pressure from the head, but he's not completely under yet. And this is no contact at all. Can you guys see that? Does that make sense with that diagram? Okay. So this is our midline analysis. You have to excuse the video. I couldn't figure out how to record it from my desktop. So this is just my phone taking a picture of the mm -hmm. screen and the computer. <laughs> um, but essentially you're gonna track, at least for our analysis for this, the head and the tail, which is what all the images in here are gonna be showing you guys. So you can see that this yellow is tracking the head, the purple is tracking the tail. It's gonna produce two different lines that are independently showing how the head and the tail are behaving in these situations. So if you parse this out, this is the graph that you're gonna get from this. So this blue here is gonna be the head, the red is gonna be the tail, and that's gonna be consistent throughout all of these images. And I think it's really interesting that you can break this down into three stages, at least for the Zyphoster. So this will play. So the first one here is gonna be the packing stage. So this is where the animal is going to start to move the sediment away from where its head's gonna be. Its tail is typically not gonna be moving. So if you guys can see, it's a little washed out, but it's gonna be represented by these zigzags in the headline and a still face with the tail here. So it's actually trying to pack the sediment to begin this little excavation so that it can then get its head underneath the rock to then continue. And then the next stage is gonna be a push-off stage. So the head is going to be kind of angled in a straight line and the tail is gonna be used to push off kind of like a fulcrum to shove its head underneath that rock. And that's gonna be signified here by this really large tail scoop as it's pushing up underneath that rock. And then the last stage is complete burial or at least when 
the center of mass that's underneath that rock, and it's going to be using a much more symmetrical, much more typical kind of swimming-like behavior, one that's underneath that piece of plexiglass. which is really nice. They work really well in these situations. The other two species didn't work quite so nicely, um, but they were really interesting. So what we see in Anaplarchus is they're actually using kind of a concertina locomotion, which I should specify. So when you're using concertina locomotion, this is typically something associated with snakes. Essentially what they're doing is they're pushing sediment with their tail. So their head's gonna move, they're gonna push with their tail. They're gonna bring their tail up. They're gonna push again to bring it up, kind of an accordion kind of motion. So this is what Anaplarchus uses in directional locomotion and also does it when varying. Can you guys see it? Oh. Kind of an accordion. Oh, no, it's not going. Oh. It's going to kind of push at that sediment to get underneath it. And they typically go very much further than that. They're not very good at it and it stresses them out. So they, once they get complete burial, they just sit there and they don't move. There's no, there's no <laughs> that point. So Aphrodixes is going to be doing something really different. So they seem to use burying as a stress mechanism to get away from something. Both of these species require being poked much more than that. Zytus <laughs> did it all by itself. It loved it. It would do it right away. These guys needed to be stimulated to do it, or else they really were not very interested. And Aphrodixes essentially looks a lot more like a swimming behavior. Oh. It does it very fast, so that's wow. real time. Both of those are real time. So it's not doing this exploratory stage where it's passing the sediment, it's just swimming into the sediment. And it's just doing it very aggressively. <laughs> All right, so once we look at that, we can kind of determine there are three different types, more or less, three major types of burrowing or burying behavior of fishes. So we have what sculpins and flatfish do, which is essentially just disturbing the substrate and just throwing it on top of themselves by these undulatory waves. You can do swimming burial, which is kind of what Aphrodixes does, where essentially just in what sand lances do as well, they just swim really hard into the substrate until they're eventually underneath of it. But then we're gonna kind of define packing burial as doing this, this initial motion of kind of packing it side to side, which is almost more like burrowing in mammals or in other terrestrial animals. It's really something that's not been documented in fish before. All right, so brain size. So from this point forward, we just use Zytister because they did it most willingly, they seemed to like it the best, and they were the nicest fish. So we had the exact same setup. What I didn't mention, this is our little GoPro up here, which I feel like should be obvious, but that's a little camera. Um, and we changed the grain size. So we started out with all these trials that have been in two millimeter grain size, which is, you know, yay-ish if anyone can see. They're only three millimeter is definitely larger, and their one millimeter is pretty close to the sandy type. So we changed those to see, uh, to see what they would do mechanically with their nose. So we haven't analyzed a lot of them yet, um, but what we can see is in the fine grain, they're not really having to do that packing motion quite so much. They really can just start this push off and just get right into it. They don't really need this preparatory kind of stage. They can pretty much just do it right off the bat. Um, and their push off stage is typically only one tail piece. So they don't need a whole lot of force to get underneath of it. And they seem pretty comfortable with it. But when you have a large grain, it takes a lot more effort for them to get underneath of it. So that passage stage is elongated and it extends all the way into even after their center of mass is underneath the rock. They're continually pushing stuff to the side to try to get under it. They also, this is the only time the zygotes really required any sort of tactical stimulation to get underneath of it. A lot of times they would start to go and they'd be like, no, I'm not doing this, and they would back back out of it. And we're really not very interested in burrowing into this three millimeter sediment. So that's going to suggest an uh, environmental kind of boundary or limit there. In areas that have pretty grainy, or not grainy, but a larger type of pebbly sand, um, they probably are not going to be as interested in burning it into that structure as something that's really fine. All right, the last one that we didn't really get to too heavily, but whether it's more similar to terrestrial or aquatic behavior, again, this is the same setup, except that we just took out the plexiglass and allowed them to move freely throughout the environment. They're very comfortable moving on land, and I probably should have mentioned most cicadas in general do can breathe air for about 12 hours. It's just desiccation that's going to kill them. So as long as they're kept moist, they're perfectly happy on land, and they really don't stress about it at all. So we used Zyphester for these, and we went back to the two millimeter grain size. So here's our bearing that we've got here. And then if we look at a terrestrial slide here, they're pretty similar once they get into the sediment, but I think the one thing that's notable and different is that when you're looking at varying behavior, the amplitude of the head is larger than the amplitude of the tail. It's 
almost as if they're pulling the sediment with their head, and then their tail is just uselessly trailing up behind them. They're really not using their tail to support it. However, when they're doing terrestrial locomotion, it seems that they still are using their tail in a similar, a way that's perhaps more similar to aquatic locomotion. So there's definitely similarity between the burrowing and the terrestrial, but burrowing is definitely its own class of locomotion. It's not halfway to terrestrial. It's not really a combination. It definitely is something that's a unique locomotor method. Uh, well. All right, that's it. So I'd like to thank <laughs> everyone in the fish class, the professors. Thank you, Cassandra, so much for your help and um, time. Alice, uh, everyone else in here, thank you so much.
um, is eating uh, large crustaceans and small fish, and so in general has uh, bigger particles that it's having to deal with, and so is not having to um, make have as long of an arch with a, as great of a surface area to capture these particles. Um, I also looked at average regular length. So the alosa is the biggest fish, and so regular length can correspond to um, length of the fish, and then also uh, feeding habits. Um, and so you can see here that uh, there's a general trend for the two alosas of declining regular length as you go on, but there's a lot of variation even among the same family of what the regulars are looking like and uh, how they differ. And so you can see this in, so the Alosa pseudoharangus, where the regulars are really long, in the Ambrogaster, where they're a little bit shorter. Uh, these fish have very similar diets, so this can't necessarily be attributed to their diet. It just goes to show how much variation there is between something in the same family, which is really interesting. Uh, I also looked at average regular width, which is really important for pelvic porosity uh, in terms of how dense it is, as well as spacing. Uh, and you can see, so the Clipea pelasci is the only one that really has a huge difference in the average raker width. So these are very thick rakers compared to the rest, uh, which we can look at in terms of they're eating bigger foods, they're digesting bigger particles, uh, while these other fish are looking or digesting smaller particles. And then finally, I looked at average raker spacing. So this is also really important for filter uh, filter movement. Um, you can see that the Sulosas and then the Rawlis have this, and the Amelgaster have this really um, wide breaker spacing in their first breaker, which is actually not what I expected to see. I expected more density. Um, and the Clupea is the only one that has this sort of um, less variable number in terms of spacing, and so the opisoma, this is one that is a little bit closer together, and this is one that's a little further apart. Um, and once again, it just goes to show crazy amount of variation. So the first breaker is always the longest, and but the gill rigger width and spacing for this breaker varies considerably, and I found that the interspecies differences are just as numerous as those among families, and the spacing between the rakers of the first arch tends to be larger than the following rakers, which is not what I expected to see and was pretty interesting. Um, so then I took one species, so the Alosa sapidissima, which is a beautiful skin, and I decided to look at flow. So I started off, I went real big, decided to segment the entire brachial basket. <laughs> that one didn't work. <laughs> Moved on, I actually segmented the first arch, um, which worked better, but didn't quite uh, work perfectly. And so I decided to go a little bit simpler. I found a 3D printable uh, template of a comb on Thingiverse, and I segmented out a go raker from each individual arch in Amira, then used MeshLab, and then printed it on the Form Labs printer, and this worked great. So I had my models. more than a sieve, but if there's an absorption 
observable thin boundary layer over something like this, then uh, that will speak of the fact that if I were to run particles through, these particles would roll and create vortices. Um, and so I did them individually at first. I did them individually, and it took a while to get video because I spent a lot of time on the models. They were very hard to take, and this one's really cool because you can actually, this is more of a laminar flow because it's at a slower speed, so you can see that that actually run along the rigor and then over the back, and so the arch is really important in filtration as well because it's actually catching these particles along the back and in the fish would um, hypothetically interact differently with the other rigors as well, so not just individually. So I got a lot of, I got some video at the end, and so some of the things that uh, I had to troubleshoot was the dye didn't come out in a laminar flow, so I ended up emitting the dye in concentrated pulses, so there was a lot of it so I could observe enough detail. Uh, I had to run the flume at some lower speeds to ensure the laminar dye flow because it would shake at times, so I had to kind of work around that. And uh, getting high quality close-up video with correct lighting and everything in order to be able to see was pretty hard. So, <laughs> uh, the next steps, uh, so I want to construct a working model of the idealized ratio basket, so, and then differentiate the rakers from large to small and vice versa to see how that changes the flow. And then work on particle movement through that Franco basket, so at different flow speeds and different mesh sizes. And this is my Amira segmentation of the Olympus application map, which I love. <laughs> oh, and thanks to Sarah Hoffman, Adam, Alex, and all the instructors and TAs. Thanks to Diego Boss for your teaching scanning skills, Matt Bowman for Killer Ideas, and Carly, and MC for all the things, and the Fish Club. <laughs>
today we are going to talk about fish motion in the ocean and how you can predict swimming kinematic trunks through temporal morphology. So let's start raw. As many of us have seen in our studies of fish, fish are just super diverse. They are totally different shapes, sizes, colors. They live in a lot of different habitats. Um, but the one thing that they all have in common is they can swim. So fish use a variety of fin movements and also body undulation to maneuver themselves through the water. And that is super cool. Um, one thing, like, so if you imagine a fish swimming, a lot of people might imagine something like this, where you get some quick tail beats and then they're just kind of gliding through the water. There's also some fish that might just kind of use their pectoral fins, like little suckers, <laughs> <laughs> they might move a little bit more slowly. And this is sort of what people imagine when they're like, oh, fish swim, that's, that's fish swim. But some fish use some crazy movements like this, where they're propelling themselves more with a whole body undulation, um, like this ribbon tail. And so this is totally mesmerizing and really, really cool. Um, but if you think about it long enough, you might be like, wait, okay, all of these fish have the same basic parts. They have a head, they have a set of fins, no matter what shape and size they are, they have two fins. Um, they have a spine and a tail. That's the basic makeup of the fish. But they, there's so much diversity that they're just able to move in a lot of different ways. So that is what led to this project. Um, just thinking about the anatomical and the morphological diversity that allows for um, so many different swimming kinematics. Um, I wanted to see if there were specific um, anatomical structures that could help us predict um, swimming kinematics. And so using one of those traits that all the fish have, we looked at spines. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to tell you about how we can use the, the temporal morphology to actually predict swimming kinematics. So to do this, I use a model that Cassandra has been working on for a while now, um, and she has used vertebral morphology to predict swimming kinematics in elongate fishes. And so what I wanted to do here was validate that model and then also see if I could maybe break it with, <laughs> with some non-elongate fishes. And so in this case, we have uh, six different species that I use um, with elongate fishes being the Anthropus progressus and the Bolus ornata. And for the purposes of this study, we're going to say that an elongate fish, just like that ribbon eel video that we saw, they're going to be moving their whole body to kind of undulate forward instead of mostly using their tail or their pectoral fins to move throughout the water. Okay, so I collected a bunch of swimming data. Uh, I placed an acrylic and plastic cutout in the middle of one of the sea tables to make a, a track. And then I placed some white acrylic at the bottom of one side of the sea table to have that solid white background uh, so that you can clearly see the fish. Um, and so then uh, with a GoPro overhead, so this would be the dorsal view of the fish that's swimming, um, I used five individuals of each species and got five videos of each of those individuals using a steady swimming motion. And in this case, I'm referring to steady swimming as they're moving at about the same rate throughout the entire video. And I also wanted to see that body undulation. So for example, in the somatogaster aggregata, they use a lot of pectoral fin movements to move themselves. So I had to like scare them a little bit so that they moved a bit faster and flipped their tail long enough to get some kinematic data. So this kinematic data, uh, once we took the videos, we put them into MATLAB and we could trace the midlines of the fish over the course of the video. And so this is what that uh, kind of looks like. And we could pull a lot of swimming kinematic data from those midline traces. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna focus on body amplitude. So imagine if we took this midline trace and we kind of flattened it so that the fish was swimming, swimming fairly straight, which always happens. Um, uh, you would basically have that straight line and then the amplitude would be measured as the distance from that straight line to wherever the body is across the body for the whole video. And you kind of, you get all of that data and it's awesome. 
So once you have that um, for body amplitude, you take all of those measurements and you kind of make an equation that will allow you to take any sort of um, position along the body and put it into the equation and you should get the amplitude at which that body is at if you have it in that straight line. And so put that on hold. Next, we collected uh, vertebral morphology. So this is uh, a scan that we placed in a slicer and to orient you, this is the anterior portion of the fist and this is the posterior. So this is bullet formata. And so we went in and we measured um, just things. So we have centra bottom length. Um, this is an entire centra. And we measured centra body length and then centra cone diameter, centra canal diameter, and then centra cone angle. Um, and so we got this data from seven to eight centra along the vertebral column and we wanted them to be evenly spaced and then just like got an average of what the vertebral morphology was like um, in each individual and then three individuals of each species averaged it all out. Um, and so what we do with this data is we put it into this model, which is a big word for <laughs> we put it into this model, and basically what happens is, in this case, I'm going to talk about center of cone diameter. Um, the model runs a partial least squared regression, um, and it fits a second order polynomial for the data. So you can have uh, the cone diameter um, from along the position of the body of all the different species, and you have that plotted, it fits the, it fits the line, and then it's going to take the coefficients from that line and figure out um, which coefficients are most important and how exactly to weight each of the uh, vertebral parameters. So between the cone diameter, the body length, the cone angle, all of that good stuff, it figures out which uh, vertebral parameter is most important to predicting uh, the swimming impact. And so once we have all that, we found out that the model works. It was very cool. So um, we got the equation out and it turns out that the predictive power of the vertebral data is very significant. And the most important vertebral parameters are central cone angle and central body length. Um, so with cone angle, this makes uh, pretty intuitive sense because as you inc increase the amount of space within the centra, um, there are more squishy bits, as Kristen Cassandra <laughs> calls them, that allow the, the centra to just like be more flexible. But then also, as you increase the length of the centra, um, you are going to have more stiffness along the vertebral column. So when you have shorter vertebrae, you're going to have more flexibility. Also, when you have more space um, within each centra, there's going to be more flexibility as well. So let's take a bit of a dive into the equation. So in blue, we have the swimming amplitudes um, that we get from the swimming videos. And then in red, you have the predicted amplitudes that you get from the, um, the model. And so this is super cool. Um, here you have a video of the bullets are not swimming. Um, and then this is what the model predicts the swimming pattern is like. But as you can see, there's a little movement at the head, similar to in the video. And then as you get further along the body, you get an increase in the amplitude away from that midline. Um, and so we also see this in the Antarctic turborescence. So the elongate fish held up, the model worked. And what was even more surprising was that the non-elongate fishes were even more um, they work even better than the non elongate fishes, which I was not expecting. So the key here is to look at the slope um, because that's what's really important. You can move the lines up and down depending on your species, again, all that good stuff. But if you are, are looking at this, you can see how the body amplitude is increasing along the position of the body. And at first glance, you might be like, those two lines look really different doesn't seem that impressive. But then if you think about it, like we took five different measurements of vertebrae, put them into a model that fits some lines, and it came out with something like this that is um, like on the same magnitude, doing the same general slope. 
and I think that is super cool. So I am really excited to continue working on this model. Um, of course, I want to in the future analyze all the data that I collected because that did not happen in the, the three weeks. Um, and then I would love to add more species. You may have noticed that I didn't get to the Somatogaster aggregata because as I said, they use a lot of pectoral fin movement instead of body undulation. And so that might, in the future, we might have to do something like put them in the full tank and have them swimming at a higher speed to actually get that full body undulation. We can also use other fishes such as um, sunfishes, other fish that are kind of more deep bodied and swim with their tail more than a full body undulation. Um, so that would be awesome. And then as we continue to improve the model and really try to understand um, what parameters need to be weighted more or what matters more, how to actually predict swimming kinematics even better, we could potentially take fossils, um, so extinct specimens, look at their vertebral morphology and think about how, how will we predict that these fishes swim. Um, and I think that would be incredible. I don't know about the rest of you, but instead of just looking at a fossil being like, here's the recreation about swim. <laughs> um, so with that, I would like to thank Adam, Alice, all the other instructors here for all their contributions to this learning experience. Diego, hoping you can click through all of those scans. Um, Mackenzie and Sarah for your insights and your help throughout this entire um, experience. Special thanks to Cassandra for you know, creating the model and to uh, coming and helping every time I was worried about breaking. Um, and then also all the rest of you in the fish class for the great thanks from the physics. <laughs>
I'm just going to um, explain to you all my frustrations with the current terminology for some of these structures that we're going to see in some of these beds. So um, when I talk about theory, we're talking about these um, little projections on the fish's face. So this is a blepsia cirrhosis. You're going to see this a lot, so be ready. Um, so when we look at fish, um, we've been talking a lot about, in all these talks, all the different varieties of fish. Um, people like to talk about their colors and their fins. I'm particularly interested on the business end of things, on their face. Um, and when we look at all these different fish, a lot of, we see a lot of variation in these projections that come out of their faces. So in sturgeons and catfish, we have these things um, called barbells, and these are really heavily studied. People have done lots of histology on them. They've sort of defined some of the characteristics that are um, making up these structures, and they've really heavily studied a lot of their function and the behavior, how they use them. But then there are all of these other fish, and there's so many in here that are not included. These are just some of my favorites. So on my end of the coast um, in Florida, we have tons of these uh, lionfish that are invasive in our coast, and they have a huge variety of all of these projections on their face. I'm going to avoid using the word theory as much as possible because I don't think that these are actually theory. Um, so they have all of these projections on their face and they come in different um, shapes and forms. This is the peacock morph, so it's got these uh, extra segments and bits of skin that come out of the projections and they have little circles and people have no idea what they're for. And then we also have all of these skull fins that have a wide variety of head ornamentation. So we've got um, a moth type skull fin here with some smaller cranial projections and then blepsius with these really interesting um, cranial projections in the front of their face and then of course not picky with um, some pieces that sort of look like the lionfish structures on top of their um, eyes. And so like I said they, we've studied there have been tons of studies on sturgeons and catfish barbels, and so these have been defined as barbels. They don't call them theory. We're pretty sure they're barbels. Um, and what they have found in um, a lot of these SEM studies is in sturgeons, we see here an olfactory uh, receptor cell on the epithelium, and on it you'll see uh, little microvilli and cilia. So these are going to help with olfaction and um, all the uh, sensory cells, and then in the barbell of catfishes, they've defined that they have type 1 taste buds, so what this means is that they're going to be used for mechanoreception as well as chemoreception, and that's compared to type 2 taste buds that are only used for chemoreception, so they have um, different, go back, they have different structures on them that allow for, again, more cilia and other things embedded in them. They also might have some hair cells embedded in them, again, for more mechanoreception. And so these have been really heavily studied and characterized as bar cells. And so when I came to the fish class, we did a lot of hard labor the first two weeks. <laughs> singing and trawling, bringing them, sinking boats, all of that. Um, yeah. And so when we did all of these really fun activities, we pulled up a bunch of skull fish. That's why we have lots of skull fish studies here. And when we pulled them out, everyone was excited about how they swam and their vertebral columns. I was super excited about their faces and all of the fun stuff on their faces and all the theory. And as we were preparing for our fish quizzes, I realized that a lot of the time, some of the characteristics that were used to identify or differentiate different species were basically just counting what kind of structures they have in their face, how many, where they are. So Blepsy, as we know, has the um, bits on the front of their face, and where um, Globicep has the theory on their top of their head, and um, not to see have just the pair on their eyes. So we think about these a lot. They're important for us and to differentiate these fish, but what are they? I am seriously serious about my <laughs> <laughs> oh, <I'm done. laughs> I want to It's a lot of title work that we come out of this. And so one of my questions is, what are they made of? So if they're theory, what is making up a theory? If it's barbells, do they have taste buds then? And then what are some of the things inside of these structures? So to get a look at the outside of the structures, I use um, SEM, or scanning electron microscope, to get um, some of those beautiful views of those taste buds that we saw in the, um, cat, the catfish and the sturgeons. I also did lots of clearing and staining. It's my favorite. Also, working on trying to 3D image some cleared and staged specimens. We'll talk about that if you're interested. Super exciting. 
we have hopeful images. So come talk to me afterwards about that as well if you want to learn more. This is a line dish that I've previously cleared and stained. You can see there, not theory, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> um, and then my other question is, is so once we know what they're made of, what are they for? So if we have taste buds, we can think about it being sensory. If we don't have taste buds, but we have a cartilaginous support or they're attached to muscle, what are they using them for? Are they still healing? Are they sensory? Are they decoration? Are they camouflage? It all really depends on um, the morphology and the makeup and also how they use them. So I didn't have um, any live fish that I worked with since I was clearing a stain and I scanned them. So I'm going to draw some inferences from the histology and morphology of these structures. And then my third question is, are there different forms in different um, and different species that have maybe different functions. So like I said, we had all of these different um, types of sculpins. So I compared two families. I compared the Cotidae and the Hemiparidae to see sort of if they have different morphologies and then potentially different functions. So again, here's Lepsius. I told you to see lots of pictures of this. Um, this is a smaller one, not quite juvenile, and this one's a larger one that I set in gelatin. Um, and you can see really clearly these um, big structure, not theory, on here. <laughs> and um, in clearly stained specimen, when we look at them, we see the red stained structures are usually bone, and then the blue are cartilaginous structures. So from these clearing and staining specimens, we can infer that they actually have cartilaginous and pretty densely cartilaginous supports in their not theory. And they, um, these, because these have been studied before, there was a paper that came out and they talked about these angular rods inside of them. Again, we still don't know why they would have cartilage in these structures. Um, what are they supporting? What are they holding up and why? Um, but we do know that they have 11 of these bills theory. So they have actually six underneath right here. So there's three pairs and then there's two really smaller ones in the back that you can take a look to see over here, and then they have a pair on the top, um, on the front part of their dorsum, and they just have this one weird one that starts to stick back. So they definitely have a lot of these not theory on the front of their face, and um, they are supported by cartilage. Then when we looked at them in the SEM, so I drew some little cartoons to help you guys sort of orient through these SEM structures. So we're looking at the front of the face of the fish, and we've got these um, nasal pores, so you can see them there, and then we actually have the um, projection on their face right here. So we'll delve in a little deeper. So when we look at the nasal pore, we know that these are structures that are used for sensory. So we try to compare um, the structures on the nasal pore to the not theory. And what we see here is some, thanks Carly for letting me know, some actual uh, taste buds along the nasal pore. And then this structure, which is unidentified so far, more histology to come, and I'll let you know what it is. So there's these um, sort of sheets that run into the nasal pore that have some hair-like structures on them. So potentially, again, for sensory, but there's definitely taste buds along the nasal pore, and you'll see those throughout the species that I compared. They'll have these uh, taste buds along their uh, nasal pore. So we know those are for sensory. Then when we looked at some of their ventral theory, we um, got a close up and we actually found some little buried mechanoreceptor cells, so hair cells buried and embedded in their theory. So not only are they supported by cartilage, but they also have these um, mechano potentially mechanoreceptive cells um, to be used for chemoreception as well as um, mechanoreception. So similar potentially to catfish barbells, so maybe barbells and not theory. And then when we got another close up, a, a lateral view of one of these uh, barbells in Lepsius, we actually found some that had these uh, cilia, uh, cilia along them. So we still, again, need to do more histology to verify exactly what cells these are, but they look, seem to look like they have all of these cilia, again, supporting these taste bud uh, type cells on the, on the barbell mm -hmm. on Lepsius. Then I looked at Noptixes, and so Noptixes uh, have these barbells on their side of their eyes, like on the top part, the lower dorsal portion of their eyes. They only have those two pairs from the schematic. You can see them right there. They're usually fan-shaped and really ornate. And if you get a closer look, you can see that there is actually a small rod of cartilaginous support in there as well, or potentially cartilaginous support. So again, more histology 
were there by that. So yeah, they're really supported in the structures, same family as the black deer mm -hmm. in this area. So when we FEM them, they do have this um, crazy fan-like structure, and we got in a little closer, and we couldn't see any well-defined taste buds on these structures. Um, I tried to zoom in more and more and more, and there were bits and pieces that almost looked like taste buds. Again, more histology would really clear it up, but they don't seem to have as clearly defined taste buds, and they didn't have any of those um, mechanoreceptor hair-like cells embedded in them like the blepsias. So definitely different from the blepsias. Theory, barbells, don't know yet. Um, and then in Jordania, so note, so now we're in the family Cotidae. So these guys also had um, theory, they actually had 10, or theory barbells, they have 10 of these structures on their head, so they're five pairs. The ones on the top of their um, eyeballs are usually uh, paired, or they have some uh, branching off of them, so they're really ornate structures. But as you can see here, they stain deep, deep blue, again, suggesting potentially cartilaginous supports in these structures as well. So when we FEM them, again, the um, supraocular hmm. uh, structures, these definitely, again, showed some taste buds looking cells um, along their uh, structures. So these might potentially also be barbells like we saw in Blepsia. Then we're looking at clinoclotis Clinicatus globiceps, and what I really was interested in this one, this one's called the Mosshead Sculpin. We all know that it has tons of Siri on its head and all of these structures, so they also have 10 barbells or Siri on their face as well, compared to like, just like Jeronia the note. And when we FEM them closer, again, really well defined taste bud looking cells on along these. So, and some of them were also um, bifractured, just like with the nose. So again, maybe increasing surface area or increasing um, the angles that you can get these taste buds in so that you can get those um, sensors to stop. And then when we looked at Clinicatus globiceps, this is another cotidae, but this one had the least amount of um, Siri or barbells on them compared to the other cotidae, and they were um, much simpler. And so we compared it to the nasopore, we looked at its nasopore, and it did have some of those taste buds. They were a little bit smoother, but they did have some hair cell-like structures in their nasal pore. And then when we looked at their actual, oh sorry, I'm sorry, this is still glo uh, globiceps. So they still had those hair cells, and they were um, just like the taste buds on their structures. And then compared it to Oligocotus fermentensis, who had less barbells on its head, those structures were much smoother. There are no clear looking taste bud things, sort of that outline structure is there, but not super well defined. And um, their nasal pores were a lot smoother. Again, the taste buds were not super well defined. I'm sorry, that was a little confusing. And so when we compare them all together and we looked at them all together, we can see the cotidae are all up here. They had a variation of the amount of barbells or theory on their face. So um, the the nose and the globiceps had about 10 of them. They had well-defined taste buds, um, potentially supported by cartilage. And the nose, I still have to finish my theory of saying uh, globiceps and reminiscence um, to really see if they had cartilaginous support. It looks like reminiscence does so far, um, but reminiscence doesn't really have those very clear taste buds. We need to do some more histology to really verify what kind of cells we have in there. And then in the hemisphere we found that Blepsius has these 11 barbell structures definitely have some taste buds and potentially even some mechanoreceptor cells um, embedded in them. So potentially these are really sensory cells and very much like the catfish and the sturgeon. So potentially not Siri and barbells, which is ironic because they're the roast. Um, and then Hemiparidae, uh, again, the Noctixes, they only have the two barbells, but they have this really ornate structure. If I do more histology and I can really figure out if they have taste buds, potentially they just have a really big surface area on their um, barbell or theory on the top of their head. So my goals in the future are to really define the differences between what is a barbell and what is a theory in um, the way I think about it. And what we've defined with catfish and sturgeon, barbells are more sensory, they have um, more uh, develop structures, they have supports um, in catfish, sometimes they're actually even attached to muscles so they can be moved, whereas theory might potentially be for camouflage or just um, skin flaps and they have a different structure. So my goal is to sort of partition out which one is which so we can all be serious about our theory. <laughs>
And with that, I'd like to thank the whole Fish Club, um, Alice and Adam, fantastic mentors, Sarah and Cassandra, for helping me out with absolutely every question that I've ever had. And then, of course, all of you for listening to me complain and yell about Siri. And then, of course, all of my loving, delicate fish friends. And a special thanks to Ellie Summers for being more support and providing chocolate late at night. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Joel, and today we're going to talk about stingray barbs and how the shape and the serration on the barb injuring influence the shape, uh, the puncture, and the throughout process. So, what a barb? It's this. It's not a sign. I precise this because there is serration on it, and they can be separated into portions like the tip, the serration, and the base. And this mold is from a freshwater stingray, Protomus regular spinny. And I'm gonna select a few models for my experiment because I want to test the shape. And after scanning 62 species, it's about 30% of the actual diversity of stingrays in the world. I have a pretty good idea of what looks at the bar and what the shape is too. <laughs> so our model right now has we use Potamus Regan Ariba, an exclusively freshwater stingray from South America living in the Amazon. Fruitbridge Regan Sleepnipper, an Asian freshwater, brackish water stingray uh, living mostly in the Mekong. And Eurobalis Adderi, a coastal marine stingray uh, who is mainly found in the Black Sea. So after scanning them in the CT scanner in the FHL, we isolated the bulb. This is the true bulb from the CT scanner. And then we boosted them in the aiming star for the future testing I'm going to talk about. And as you can see, they look different. So <laughs> there is difference here in serration, in the base shape, in even the tip. You can see there's also like a different space between the serration. Some are really narrow, some are really uh, big spaces. And for that, I can show you some measurement. And for those models, I can precise that this species, Ruby Dragon Signature, has a lot of serration along the length of the bar. Uh, Eurobalis artery has a mostly shaped, uh, flat shape, and Summer Dragon is like an average shape of that too. So I print a uh, different model to test different things, so the shape and the serration. And you can see this is the percentage of serration we find on the bar, so 0% of serration, many only the shape of the bar. 25% is only close to the tip, and the natural or more than 50% of serration. So, for those of you that didn't see what stingray <laughs> can do, it's simple and it can oh, do no. deep. <laughs> oh. 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 oh! So, few people already talk about no. the Kinematics, <laughs> the kinematics are in a recent paper about the speed, the average speed, and the shape of the movement of the tail to do that puncture. And I want to test that in different speeds, so high speed and slow speed. And to reference the high speed, I will use the paper from Anderson, who used ballistic gel. And for the slow speed, I'm going to use MTS because we have a lot of tool in FHL to play with. <laughs> So for the high speed test, I basically built a model. Uh, it's a spring projecting tool in that it was CVC pipe, the spring that I can compress with that trigger. And we shoot the ammo in the ballistic gel by recording everything in a high speed camera to calculate the velocity, to be sure we have the constant speed. 
And then we measure the penetration length and calculate the estimate of penetration forces of the puncture force. Um, my average speed was 500 centimeters per second. It's quite high in comparison to the paper of Yoshi in 2019. But it will work for the IC spot. Uh, then, as I say earlier, I'm going to compare the puncture and the pull out forces. So, after that experiment, I use the NL force transducer to measure the amount of forces I needed to use to pull out the bar from the back of the PR. And then for the slow speed, I said that I was working with latches, so basically I put the sample here and I will act go down in the back of the PR here, holding by this force, recording the force needed to puncture that gel, and then goes up and measure the pull out forces. So I speak about plastic <laughs> gels. It's quite easy to make, and we're gonna just do a quick recipe of it. So you just need a pan, a container, gelatin, like most people you can use like unflavored gelatin. It's better because it melts really bad already. Uh, water, you mix everything in cold water, then you pour it in the pan, you heat it, and go to the freezer. And you don't forget to put that on the container <laughs> if you want to get the gel. <laughs> so we use that formula, like of 50 grams of gel and 500 milliliters of water to get the right density. Uh, Ginedal criticized in 2019 that the density will be really close to morphone. About the other property of morphone, it's going to be different. So we're just going to talk about the density. So that's my gun work. That was the first. Idea. Let me to try to do this. <laughs> so basically, what you're gonna see here is the different morphotypes shooting in the back of the So some things can be fast. But I'm gonna connect that to this thing. So as you can see already, there's difference in the penetration length and how the valve stay in the gel or not. So that's an interesting discovery. Um, yeah, that was fast. Um, so usually, like with this species, we can see that she fits in the gel and stay in the gel. But those two have like a bounce back. They have the forces of the gel. Like restraining them and pushing them backwards. That's kind of weird because those two have the most serrated one. So what happening right now? This one is like a single triangular shape of serration. We're gonna talk about that. <laughs> so after measuring the process, we put that in a graphic over time. And as you can see with the MTS, I have the data of the puncture and the rupture of the valve gel here, and that's the end of the embedment. Because when I did the try with my gun, like the maximum length of penetration I have is three centimeters, so I stay with that value to stay constant in my analysis with the MTS. So after three centimeters of embedment, I just effectuate the pull out. But I will talk about it later. This is for Trigon, the freshwater sigma from Amazonia. This is to the Trigon, and as you can see, there's already a difference between the rupture forces needed to rip the gel. But they follow the same thread after this. Those little it end up can be influenced by the serration. And this is Alirai, almost non, non fixed variable here, staying straightforward, and that's why should go deeper. And when you're going to the pull out, so the serrated one needs more forces to get pulled out from the gel. Seems logical. We're gonna talk about that then something will happen. Mm -hmm. But as you can see, more serrated one, more forces, less serrated one, less forces. What about the result? Are they significant? <laughs> Are they really different? Um, so your values shown the highest viability on the forces needed to puncture, like the thrust is still going in, but they also show like 0.7 newton to puncture. That was quite 
a number, but they don't show like significant differences right now if you just looking at the shape of it. If you add serration, we're gonna talk about it. <laughs> so if you look at the pull up, that's only testing the shape, you see something different. Like there is a huge gap and a huge trade off between pre trigon and per trigon, and they basically have kind of the same serration, just the number and the density look different around the length of the bar. And uh, you have this artery that show a lot of variation. It's really weird. And I also try to just pull up the bar when I embed them in the gelatin, so that when I made the gel, stay liquid, put the bars in it, put that in a fridge, and test the MTS to see how it goes. And this is highly significant. The urobatis needs a lot of forces to get growled when there is no puncture and there is like less serration. And those bars are highly serrated, but they need less forces to get growled when there is no puncture. So we look at more precision about the serration and the density. So this time, when you look at the puncture and the serration, there is a difference. There, there is a significant relationship between those. That means the serration helps the shape to get the puncture. If we look at the pullout, there is also something significant, and they also show the same pattern that you don't need that much serration. Like 25% of serration is enough because after that, you will like put less forces into it. That doesn't gonna change anything if you get rise up the number of serration. And finally, if you go to you look to the embedded one, this is where the, the differences are the most visible. So allergy, like I said, need a lot of forces to get grout. Uh, uh, signifer less forces and parallel bar on average. So how can we expect like if we embed the bars that don't need that much forces if they are serrated to get grout? It's probably because serration. <laughs> can cut the gel <laughs> to get pulled out. So the serration can help the bars to be pulled out from the predator they're in. And that's pretty useful because you don't want to get attached to your predator. <laughs> but allergies, I don't know how allergies that need to put three newtons to get out of the specimen. So I want to do further analysis on the breaking to see if iris is more subject to break in the predators, and what about the difference between those other stingrays? Do they break or just like, it's easy to pull out so they stay? And why do you need to invest in some structure that's gonna break anyway in the end? So there is also a fun experiment to do with polarized light to see the constraint. And as I explained, I only use one type of striking, the vertical striking, and in the literature, there's two methods, the slashing one. So maybe allergy is mostly due to slash and less puncture. So for everything, I would thank everyone in the Pachea, uh, mostly the teaching staff, and all the class, because I have some nervous breakdown in the last experiment. <laughs> <laughs> you Thank you. I think we have 20 people watching on live stream, <laughs> including from Saudi Arabia. Okay. It was a chat. <laughs> so basically, I compress the string inside the gas, and it's just the ammo that I deal. And after a countdown, three, two, one. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> We're afraid of a stingray gun. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, I have a specific contact that with the... So usually, the usually when the stingray will puncture you, there is no contact with the tail, it's only the spine. They will like, they have that flexibility to sting you without touching every other part of you. But the spine needs to be touched. Oh, the spine's gonna go deep in you, like, for sure. <laughs> I mean, it's not like a space between the spine and the reach of it. Oh, no, there's no really in the stingray. They, they don't shoot the bow. I, I need it to represent the speed, and I use a, something that propel, propel, but it's not the accurate proposition. Like, in nature, they will push through all along, so they will create more forces, but they don't really need forces, because less than one newton, and they go in the muscle. Oh yes. In the west. To the front side. So basically the difference is is this one looks like more triangular shape and oriented backwards. But those are more arcing like. Like really if you look at that you're thinking it's a hook and it's gonna stain the flesh and it's going to spread apart when they're going to pull out. But basically, they're going to rip apart when they start cutting, and then it's going to just be easier to get pulled out, because this is the larger part, and this is like thinner, <laughs> so it's not going to touch your flesh after that, so it's just going to pull through easier. Otherwise, you will have to find tools, hopefully with not a loaded gun. <laughs> Leave 
your arm of the jaw. And so we have this portion of fortune going across. And so with the gradient of fortune going from the tip of the jaw to the back of the jaw, we see a gradient of stress. Where the teeth at the front of the jaw that have less force have, are bearing less stress, and the teeth at the back of the jaw are bearing more stress. And in this situation, we have lost that homodox function. All of the teeth are experiencing, are experiencing stress in different ways, and they're responding to them. Um, and you wouldn't want your front delicate tooth here to have to puncture with the same rate as his back tooth. He's crushing. So how do we get back to this homodont dentition, this homodont functionality? What we see in our model is that we have to change the surface area. It's something that gives. And so we can either become short and round, or we can become tall and thin. And we reach the next problem, which is an area, uh, a problem with surface area across the jaw. We don't have unlimited space to become these big white teeth or to become these really tall, slender teeth. So we want to test, can we, or do we see a homodont function in heterodont dentition? Is that, that is accepted variation? And so we can take what we built up in our theoretical model and apply it to a hypothesis that if you are a functional homodont, all of your teeth will fall around this mean stress value despite their position on the jaw. And so you can have teeth of various surface areas all uh, bearing the same stress. And then functional heterodonty kind of comes in two flavors. You have this less expected type of heterodonty where you're going to have greater stress at the front teeth and a more expected form of heterodonty where you have greater stress at the teeth in the back. Um, so if we move on to some, oh, I guess, yeah. So what our data would then look like is if we have a functional homodont, the teeth are going to fall within some certain confidence limits of our, stress, our mean stress across the jaw, whereas a functional heterodont, the majority of the data is going to fall outside of it. And this is great because now we have a functional model that we can use to test actual tooth morphology to see there's a functional heterodont or functional homodont. The way we go about this is we go into more of our in the open science framework and we take a CT scan and we can segment out the jaws using a mirror, and then we go in and we sample teeth equally across the jaw from the anterior to posterior, and we'll measure them for height and radius and surface area, and that gets us parameters of teeth performance and fluval surfaces. We can then measure the distance that these teeth are from the jaw, so from the posterior end forward, and plug that into our model and solve for force and stress and very different manipulations. And so if we take a look at the first guy we looked at, it's a lizard fish with three years ago, and this this is a piscivorous fish, very aggressive, and it's been described as a homodont with these long, slender, uh, cone-like teeth. So when we actually take a look at the CT scan, what we see is that there's two different types of teeth here. We have these really long, slender teeth on the medial surface of these jaws, and much shorter, but still conical and slender teeth on the outside. And so what this fish was once described as a homodont in dentition is more likely a heterodont. But regardless, these are cone-like teeth. We would think they would be great for puncture. Maybe they're doing something different with the outer air, or maybe they're all doing the same thing. Maybe there's more of a functional purpose to having big teeth surrounded by little teeth. And when we plot our data against the position, against the mean stress values, we find that for both the upper and lower jaws, so lower jaws are in blue, upper are in red, we find that the majority of our data is falling within the confidence limit. And so, woohoo, functionally homodont. <laughs> Model works. The fish that we thought was homodont, turned out to be heterodont is homodont function. All of these teeth are more or less bearing the same stress regardless of where they are on the jaw and regardless of their surface area, which is kind of neat. But what about a fish that has conical teeth that's not really making them to puncture? And so we have the analogous Camira. This is a deep sea fish with some gnarly looking dentition up here. They have a total of 12 teeth on the upper and lower jaws with the teeth front fangs being incredibly elongated with the uh, fangs coming off of them and being able to pinch this basically curving lingually underneath the premaxilla. And these teeth are really thought to be used for puncture, rather they have a tongue that's doing a lot of the same manipulations, but do these kind of follow the same stress and force values we had predicted in our model? And not really. Um, it's falling within our mean confidence limit, but these teeth that are at the center of the jaw, and the teeth that are at the far back end of the jaw are experiencing the most amount of stress, and part of the jaw are no stress at all. But this is fine because we have a model that predicted what two different types of heterodonty we would see, and we see that, hey guys, there we go. We see this trend of the teeth at the back of the jaw are experiencing greater force and greater stress than the teeth at the front. And so this is not a functional homodont, it's probably functionally heterodont, but everybody's doing something different. The next we look at the Ophiodon elongatus. This is a very aggressive piscivorous fish that has some gnarly dentition. Um, definitely heterodont 
ever describing it in morphology. They have interspersed equally along the jaw, these much, much larger pompous teeth, interspersed with smaller teeth. They're under constant replacement. You see teeth coming up from the side of the jaw, outside of the jaw. It's crazy. And on the upper jaw here, what's really interesting is we have almost an even uh, spread of small pompous teeth, but the more anterior portion of the pre maxilla, we have a bit greater variation with these fang like teeth and much more smaller conical shaped teeth. But everyone's about a comb. And so are these clumps in homodont or heterodont in our model? In the lower jaw, they are from the heterodont. Okay, so we've got this interdispersion of big cones, small cones, but they're all kind of doing the same thing. That's fine. When we take a look at our upper jaw, again, it's functionally heterodont, and so we start to really analyze where do these clumps are coming from. And if, if we look at the values that are starting to congregate around our new stress values, those are the values of the teeth that are found along these long arms, the pre maxilla. Whereas the values that are congregating down here in this low stress area are all of the small and large fangs on the anterior portion of this pre maxilla. So we've got to say, what if we flip this jaw um, based on its morphology and based on where it's falling out across our spot? So when we extract uh, the small conical teeth, we find that the majority of our data are falling within the mean confidence limits of our stress value here, and that these, all these small conical teeth are probably doing the same thing. They're probably dispersing forces in a very similar way. But at the anterior portion of the jaw, we're not so convinced. We first can see values congregating around this mean, but those are all teeth stemming from these really small conical projections on the anterior part of the maxilla, with the large fangs all falling out far below this stress. And so they're not quite doing the same thing, but when we take a look at the actual surface area values, we find that the surface area for the small teeth equals the surface area of the large teeth. They are almost exactly the same. And so it got us thinking, why do we see this pattern of large teeth surrounded by small teeth? We saw it in the lizardfish, the Cerita, and we saw it in the uh, Ophiodon. And so our hypothesis became, okay, if you had one tooth puncturing into a prey item, you might tear it. You might not be able to grab onto it. That tooth might break, a lot of bad things. But if you had many teeth that were able to disperse those forces equally, you might be able to better grab the prey. And so that's what our hypothesis was. And then we can see in real life kind of what these fishes are doing. Um, here's a lizard fish. Here, eating a flatfish. Um, whoever studies flatfish in this class, not you. Oh. 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 <laughs> but basically, they have to grab and pull that prey into their mouth. And so, if you if put all of this force on these individual tiny teeth, you might be more likely to break them. You might be more likely to tear through your prey. So can we quantify that variation and can we quantify it in a functional way? So what we did was we set up another model in the material testing system where we have a single point model that represents one tooth that would drag in through muscle versus multiple teeth that all have the same surface area. So the surface area of the small teeth is equivalent to that of the big teeth. We plug it into the blessed gel at a 90 degree angle and we do unidirectional pull with such measures of load of how a tooth might pull through muscle. And what we find is that in our multiple point model, you can take on four times the load than with a single point model. And so we're starting to get this, some sort of evidence or some sort of suggestion that this relationship of morphology of big teeth to little teeth played a really important role in how we're able to retain prey, pull prey in, and not break our teeth when we come into contact. And another way that we can begin to visualize this is using photoelasticity, where we can measure the diameter of stress rings coming off of a tooth as we puncture it through the gel. And so here's our single point model versus our multi point. And what I really want you to gather from this is that in our single point model, the gel, uh, the stress ring in the gel is significantly larger than that of any of those in our multiple point model. And so we can use this as a proxy to say how much stress is that on these teeth um, and begin to quantify even further the relationship between the small and large teeth that we see. Um, so huge thanks to our TAs who are incredible. All of our instructors, Matt McKenzie, SHL, and then Hannah at MC, who taught me how to use R in a very short <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> throw down, throw down. <laughs> Is that it? All right. When are we coming back? All right. Hang on. I just have to tell everyone, the live stream won't run the entire time. It only does four hours. So I'm going to stop this one and restart at 1.30 West Coast time.